Okay, so um, so my my name is Tito. Um, uh, from University of Oslo. I'm based in Nairobi, and um, uh, today we we want to talk about um things that people uh, do after the installation. When you have a fresh install of DHIS2 instance, uh, maybe you are using tools or you just following a guide doing your install. Um, there are you know, things that you, you would do to make sure that um, your resources are optimized, to make sure that whatever you have on your host, you know, are being utilized by the by the apps that you have, the application components, which which includes Postgres uh, and, and your uh, and your web application. So I prepared um, a few slides just to walk us through the what we have today, and then after that we shall you know go to a use one one of the of the problem that I just created for for demonstration purposes, and a few problems that you might. You know, face and and you you've completed your installation, but it's nothing is working. You you're not able to access whatever you've deployed from your browser. So um, yeah. So uh, these are the slides that I prepared, and um, it's gonna you know um, take us through the the tips and tricks. You know, troubleshooting tips and tricks, and and post install uh, things that you need to do. So I'm going to start the slideshow. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, yes. Yes, we can see the screen. It's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So what's the problem? What's, what's, what's the reason why we are having this conversation today? And um, um, it's because um, normal installations, maybe we're using tools we have at, at our disposal. Maybe you just following the installation guide and you building those components one by one. And um, by default, you know, uh, the resources that you have uh, are not, uh, or the apps that you deploy are not optimized to use. Um, the defaults are not like stretching to the resources that you have on your system. And once you've completed your installation, you need to tweak configuration files um, that allows your apps and components to use uh, whatever application or, or other server resources that you have. And then um, another section is uh, you've done your installation, but nothing works. Uh, you put, you, you, you just access your URL and you're not able to get anything. You're getting errors instead. So um, what are the tips and, you know, uh, guideline, troubleshooting guideline that you need to follow? Yes. So gonna categorize into two that you need to do to tweak your your app and optimize your apps and then troubleshooting now uh, tips. Okay, so um, we have components that when you get your installation with um, with the tools or if you're doing manually, you will not miss to have a database and proxy and Tomcat. Um, proxy is going to be really your choice. You might choose to, to go with Nginx or Apache 2. And then Tomcat is normally our standard install comes with Tomcat 9 instance. And then the database, which is of course PostgreSQL 13 as of this uh, recording. So uh, we, in our standard installation, we want to, uh, do an installation where it has all these uh, components packaged. Of course, there's another component here that is not included on this slide, which is monitoring, because at the end, um, you want to, again, be able to get metrics about uh, how your database is performing, your proxy and Tomcat. So that one is also included here. So well, when you get a server, which is normally an Ubuntu uh, 18, uh, 20 or 2204, you, you have a, a host um, resources, that is CPU and, uh, and, and, and memory. So you want to budget your, your, your total memory so that you, you give Postgres, you know, um, fair amount of um, your, your memory and then web application. And of course, you don't, you don't allocate applications, all the memory 
and, and you get your host with nothing. So you need to budget um, your, your, your memory footprint so that uh, the apps have share amount, fair amount, and also the host. So we have um, Postgres and the web applications. Those are the main applications uh, that we, 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 may talk, we, we will talk about today and then the, the host. So normally uh, when you have say um, about estimate of around 64 GB of memory, uh, you, you want to, to uh, and, and say you have two instances of Tomcat. So that means you, you have how many applications here to, to budget your, your memory. You have uh, two web applications and one Postgres. So uh, by convention, it's good to, give uh, your database even a larger share. And then um, the remaining share you divide between um, your, your two web applications. So if you have, for instance, uh, 64 GB of RAM, then you want to ensure that your Postgres has about 32 GB. And then your, your other two web application is say um, 8 GB, 8 GB each uh, or, or 10, 10. And then you want to leave some amount of, um, of uh, memory to your host also, you know, a normal operation of your operating system needs some memory. So you want to leave some, some amount. So um, next up, uh, slide is, is really um, talking about Postgres SQL database, you know, uh, that you have now given your Postgres mm. some stuff. Yeah. You have a question? Okay, so um, you, you have allocated your, your Postgres SQL database some storage. Um, so you need also to tweak uh, Postgres SQL configuration. And these, these are the, uh, the settings that you need to set generally, because um, today I'm not talking about, uh, you know, Postgres SQL configuration extensively because that needs a whole session on its own. It has a lot of things that you can, you can play around with. But then I want to talk about uh, four main components that um, even uh, mentioned in our, you know, installed scripts uh, guideline. And one of them is the shared buffers. And um, out of that amount of memory that you've alloc allocated to your PostgreSQL instance, you want to give a quarter, 0.25% of, of the total, um, 0.25 um, of the total amount of memory that you have, not percent. And then if you have say 32 GB, then that is going to be about, uh, I think 88 GB uh, storage. And then um, work memory uh, is normally um, uh, calculated, uh, total amount of work memory that you want to give your post, configure in your Postgres SQL is going to be uh, a factor of um, uh, connections that you have open on, on your Postgres SQL configurations. So if you want to cal calculate total amount of work memory that is gonna uh, be at the end of the day is, is, is by mu multiplying, you know, work memory value plus maximum number of connections. And uh, if for other two GB, you can, two, you can do 10, 10 MB, and then you can multiply that by, by factor of uh, maximum number of connections that your system will be supporting. And then uh, there is maintenance work memory. Uh, and that is normally, uh, you, you want to uh, normally utilize uh, when, when, when you run your analytics and you want to at least give your system, uh, give your Postgres a good amount of uh, work memory. And then there is an effective cache, which is um, now um, um, going to be utilized for caching, Postgres SQL caching purposes. Any question up to that point? So uh, I don't think there should be a question. You are basically the example that you've given already, you said um, 64 and of uh -huh. 64, you are giving the 32. So both, basically the calculation that we're doing here for the Postgres, is it going to be it based on on the 32, not on the 64. Yeah, GB. so this this assume 64 GB is assuming that it's it's really it's for the but then before that there's this there's the budget first, which is going to 
um, with a budget, you will know which amount of memory will you allocate to Postgres. It's not necessarily, you know, this is really uh, not the system storage, uh, so, sorry, it's not system memory, but only what you've budgeted for Postgres. So if you're go going to budget 64 GB for, for Postgres in your case, then that means your system has a lot more uh, memory, even 128 or, or so, okay? okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, um, and maybe uh, just one topic. Yeah, I had a comment, uh, I nearly forgot. Um, yeah, in terms of <clears throat> Postgres in particular, um, you know, with Tomcat, you can kind of restrict how much memory it's going to use because mostly it uses its heap, and you're probably going to mm -hmm. show us this later so you can set the maximum heap size. With mm -hmm. Postgres, Postgres is greedy, right? And all of these settings that you tell it um, is not going to prevent it from using as much memory as it can find. Right? Exactly. That's the way that it works. And particularly that effective cache sizing, it will just try to use however much memory it can see. So the really important thing with the Postgres, if you particularly if you're using containers, and I know you haven't spoken about containers, but if you're using containers for your database and it doesn't matter if it's lxd or is docker you have to constrain that container so you have to when you create the container you have to configure it to say this container can only use 32 gig of ram and then after that you can do all of these settings so exactly. one of the things we've seen happen if you don't constrain the container postgres can use it'll use as much as it can and sometimes then you try to start tomcat Tomcat will fail to start because Postgres has already chewed all the memory. Exactly. Something to bear in mind. I, I was actually going to demonstrate that. And um, here we have um, uh, uh, HIS2 deployed within uh, LXD containers. If we use, if we issue LXC list, uh, we're going to see that we have uh, Postgres here. And, um, and, and, and the Postgres here is, I guess, seeing all the available memory. If we check, the memory that we have here, we have uh, 64 GB. So let's execute into the container, Postgres container, and check the memory that we, 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 we are able to see. So we memory that Postgres here is exposed is about 64 GB. And that means as Pop mentioned that it will be greedy and try to use all this um, memory that is available on its um, disposal. It's, it will try to use all this uh, available memory, which you know is, is much uh, going to even uh, use all the available system resources. So we want to limit this Postgres container so that it only sees memory that, that is budgeted to it. So that is done by, you issuing um, LXC limit command, which is LXC uh, config, and then um, container config set, is set, and that container name, which is in our case, Postgres, and then uh, memory, uh, limit that memory, and then the amount of memory that you want to give um, that container. In this case, it's 32 GB. Yeah, so that, that is gonna limit your container, your Postgres container in this case, so that it only sees this amount of memory. And, and, and we when we execute back into the container and check the available memory, we see that it only sees uh, 32 GB right now. So even though it wants to be uh, very greedy and, and it wants to use all the available memory, then it, it's only able to see up to 32 GB. That is what Bob was talking about. Is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. Okay. So next, what we want to talk about is also um, Tomcat. So when you've uh, completed your installation, yeah, um, you want also to make sure you uh, make sure that your Tomcat is able to use um, total amount of memory that is is allocated to it. You know, and and, and that configuration um, parameter is in in this file. Yeah. Sorry is in this file default uh, Tomcat 9. Uh, so let's just quickly get to um, our install here and 
and list containers. Uh, and here we have uh, around six containers. The first two containers are, are, are posting our Tomcat instances. Let's just get the first one. LXT exec, DCIS, and then bash. And then um, we, we, we just uh, view that file, view, uh, edit that file and see its contents, uh, which is etc default Tomcat 9. So th this is the file. And um, the file has configuration, Java configuration parameters. And I guess line number what, sorry. Line number five is, is, is the line that you want to uncomment uh, so that um, you can tweak your memory that your application is gonna be using. So get to that line and then um, out of the available memory, the budgets that you have set for your Tomcat instance, then you can change here. You can change uh, these parameters uh, to the amount of memory that you want to set, say 8 GB. And then after that, you want to reload your, restart your Tomcat instance with uh, system CTL, system CTL command. I don't know if restart reload will apply configuration, but you can restart yeah, yeah, a Tomcat instance. So that will, will, will apply your, your changes so that if you say, check that process, You will see your 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 configuration changes. That is eight GB here, and um, so you, your running instance is using uh, that amount of memory that you wanted to to see. So the other parameters here that um, that I, I can I can talk about, like um, the last one here um, about um, uh, line number twenty six. This is for 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 uh, application monitoring. It's it's um, a chloride chloride uh, plugin plugin. Uh, that you want to enable, when you want to enable your cloud root monitoring, you will uncomment this line. Of course, you will need to have your, your cloud root package um, uh, and extracted into this uh, directory so that it will now be um, um, uh, monitoring your instance. Of course, there are other configuration parameters here that I, I guess we, we are not gonna talk about all of them today. Uh, it needs a call on its own. And then there's another file um, which is opt dhs2 which is instance configuration file this is just an environment configuration file for the for the tomcat but then you want to there are configuration files that are specific to the dhs2 instance and they are they are all on um, on default on this um it's this file by default so we want to see how that file looks like see in opt dhs2 dhs.com file so this is the file and on the top we we have um uh, this around these lines that are uncommented this is that st standard install this is the the defaults that comes when you do your installation uh, however uh, there are things that you might uh, want to change later on uh, to suit your environment like for instance here we have connection pool maximum size sometimes you might want to in, in a very very busy system, you want to increase this number. And this number needs to be really uh, in compliance with the number, uh, with the, the maximum connection allowed on the PostgreSQL database. Yeah, and, and even uh, much more configuration options that you can tweak and, and enable other features that you want your installation to be to be supporting. Yeah, so the standard install will, will come with these four um, uncommented or enabled settings. Of course, there's database password. This is this is just a demo instance and it's not production. And um, uh, these are going to be- on Hello, Tigo. Yes? Yeah, I Question? think this is very good. Yeah, I have one question. It's Lamin from Gambia. Will it be possible uh -huh. like some of these things, like uh, this comment, uh, uh -huh. it may be like those things which are needed, like you know, to put them in your presentation, so that if anybody do the installation, you know that these are the things you really need to uh, comment, and these are the things you need to do as part of your presentation. Yeah. So th this this comes with the standard install of um, DHIS two with the tools, and normally 
uh, these configurations that you see and commented here are, are sufficient enough. You know, you don't need to really touch anything else here. And if this, if you're using automated install, you, you don't touch this file, it's gonna happen on your behalf. Otherwise, uh, really what you need to change is the first um, defaults that I showed you, uh, that you need to tweak this to suit um, your server memory uh, availability, you know? Yeah, otherwise the other DHS2 configuration file, you don't need to really touch that and, and, and unless you have a special, special need uh, for your installation, um, yeah. Is that uh, clear? It might be worth, but we have a, a two hour session planned in the upcoming server academy, just on the dhs.com file, all of the options which are in there. So, I mean, we, we try to make sure that one gets recorded, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, as Tito says, it's 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 those first couple of lines which are the essentials that you need, mostly around your database connection. Yeah. So um, those are the tunings that you need to tweak after the installation is is completed, uh, at least on, on the side of uh, Tomcat, and then we we go to we go to proxy. Um, um, Sometimes you, you have your application deployed on slash dot application name directory. And, and, and even, even um, Gerald last time when he was testing the tools, wanted to really access the app from the root without appending the application name. So that is something that uh, is calm most of the times and, and, and the tools um, do set up the install, but it doesn't do redirects by default. So you want to come back later and get to the proxy configuration, which can be in the next uh, uh, or um, Apache 2. The line is there, but not um, at least not um, enabled. It's commented out. So you need to get to the, um, uh, the proxy configuration, get to um, the line that you need to uncomment. And I, I will demonstrate that on, on this call, at least for, for in the next proxy that we have running right now. So. Um, the site that we have is uh, dhis.com and it's returning empty response. If you just get to the root direct, you don't append application name. It's appending, uh, we, you, like you don't put a uh, forward slash application name, it's empty response. The reason why it's returning em empty response, let me just get to the, um, the root cause of, of that is that let's, let's get to the proxy. This is the main configuration file. And the reason we are getting empty response is this, that anything that is not matching, it's not matching the application name that you want to access is, is going to return a 444. So the 444 that is there is, is this really, this is it's empty response, 444, yeah. And, but however, you could, um, instead of returning an empty response, I could maybe change the tool so that we get, uh, the default in the next um, in, uh, the default in the next site static site that normally you get uh, with the installation of the next or static site that you normally get with them um, with the Apache to install. So, um, but then the line line that I wanted to talk about is this rewrite um, rewrite uh, line. So you want to uncomment this. That that means uh, whenever you access the root domain, it will be rewritten and and redirected to. HMI, of course, you need to have um, this need to match with the with the apps that you have in your system. Yeah, so sudo or, or you say system CTL. Reload. The next. Yeah. It's 15. So hours. that means uh, whenever you access this, it's going to be redirected to to default application like you've seen right now. Yeah, so that is another thing that that you can tweak on the on the proxy after the installation. Yeah, Enabling... I, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So uh, that was the uh, word file name, which you have uh, recently uncommented. 
It's the Indeed. main confirmation act file for Nginx. It's in it's in the next conf D directory. You see. No, uh, yeah, I can see, but in the configuration file, you have uncommented uh, rewrite uh, uh, line uh, there and slash HMIS. So HMIS is our wire file name, right? It's the application name. If we will list them, um, it's the Tomcat application name. If, let's get out of this container. And okay. This, you see, we have HMIS and we have DHIS. So that means every request that comes to this server are redirected to HMIS. However, okay. if you want to access now DHIS, that means you need to append or on your browser uh, DHIS. You see, for you to be oh, able to okay, get fine, that. fine, fine, fine. Got it. Yeah, something like that. Understood? Yeah. Okay, so that's one. And then number two is um, uh, monitoring tools. One of one of which is uh, Munin. Munin. Munin is is we use to monitor our instances, uh, which uh, um, can be servers, depending on the install that approach that you took, uh, or containers or the host. You know, and uh, normally default install is is not um, is leaving Munin exposed. Empty response, meaning spelling errors. Let me see. So that means you, you, you're not supplying username and password for you to get to this uh, Munin. So what we've done for that, we, we, are, we are using um, basic authentication on the, um, on the, on the Nginx level or, or, that, or rather the proxy level. And uh, on this call, I'm going to demonstrate how you're going to enable at least um, basic authentication for the for the for the muni and these are the steps of course you're going to need uh, apache 2 utils and then uh, generate the password and then edit muni location configuration and then um, enable that basic authentication we're going to run through that quickly and uh, on, on, on the same server um, we have proxy that's where you're going to do your you're, you're going to enable your basic authentication. So you need to execute into that proxy, Alexi exec, uh, proxy, and then bash. And then you need to install this package, uh, which is um, Apache 2 utils, um, app install Apache 2 utils. Yeah, they already installed, I had installed. Uh, and then um, you want to generate the password with this other this uh, line here. Um, hmm. um, just find the command in history. Yeah, it is. So, <clears throat> This is going to be a password, and then the, the, the where, where you're gonna start store your password, and then which user are you going to generate going to generate password for? You can choose uh, usernames that you want, and for this call we're going to uh, go for admin, and then it's going to ask you for the for the password for that user. I'm gonna just uh, put admin. Uh -huh. So that's um, it's generated a password for user admin and. Um, and 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 the password is the same. So and then after that, you want to edit um, location configuration for Munin because it's Munin that it, it's actually exposed to the it, it's without password. So um, normally, with the standard install, we have all in the next configuration file within um, within a conf d directory. And here we have main configuration file and then upstream configuration files. Let's get into the upstream and see what we have there. We have the HIS2 configuration. And let's just view what we have here. Here we have um, uh, uh, DHIS2 conf for, for two different instances that we have here. And then the file that is of our interest here is Munin. Munin. And at the very end here, you add the two lines. You add the two lines, which is auth basic, and then um, you want to get um, 
to add some lines here, say basic. And then I would add basic. I would basic user file where you will have your your uh, your password user and then file uh, is in our case etc dot it password it it pass wd yeah and then you want to end those And then check your Nginx configuration if they are valid, and then you reload sudo service uh, or system. And now let's try accessing our Muni um, on, on the new incognito window. Now it's going to request for username and password. Those are the ones that we just configured. And if we supply admin, default admin, then it's gonna take us through the menu. But at least now you will not uh, get to access this site without credentials. This we're monitoring uh, endpoint without credentials. Question? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, what is the essence of having password to Moonin? Is it a uh, security thread or what? Like, what is the main reason of having a uh, password? You, you know, to have yeah. like you, like you can see right now here, uh, your resources, resources that you have on, on your infrastructure, that is Postgres, Apache, everything is just exposed to the internet. Whoever has this link can log in and they can, they can like, they can see what you have already. They can get much, much more, more information about how your system is set up. And it's not good for security. You need to hide your stuff. You just uh, don't leave them to the public so that they can, uh, in a snapshot, know what you have, which which one uh, can be the, the next. Uh, they can, you know, they have a, a lot of information that they are not required to have, I think. So you need to at least, um, and you don't want to open this to the public. This is private to your infrastructure. You don't want to everybody to, to be able to access this endpoint, it needs to be really secured. Okay, this is good. What for then? It means that we have installed Moonin in our systems, which means that uh, we need to do this. But it will be also important, maybe like uh, to have a demo, like someone mm -hmm. who has Moonin, how you can mm -hmm. just enter into his system without no password. Oh, okay. Maybe like next uh, Thursday or after that, we can try to look into that. Okay, okay, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, okay. that will be interesting. Yeah, uh, and, and, and also most of our installation is being done using um, Apache. Um, I see you using Internet. I'm, uh -huh. I know basically the procedure will not be the same. Probably um, before sending the slide, you you might you might just need to add um, the, the the same for Apache and then you send the, you share the slide so that we can protect it. I never knew that the... I know the moon exposes the information, but I don't know that um, someone can take this information to hurt the system. So we need to actually protect our systems now. Yeah, yeah. So well, when when you you have, you've actually mentioned about Apache two last time when I demonstrated um, the tools, I had not uh, developed support for Apache two, but right now with the with the latest push, uh, you can pull latest. Uh, um, the source scripts and it supports Apache 2. So you would need to really change one configuration directive from Nginx and um, and put it to change it to Apache 2, like you have you had done uh, Gerald before, but it was not working. Right now it's working. Yeah. So yeah, next is that is is uh, really backup. So. Backup plan is, is not a post install uh, thing. You, you need to really plan for your backup even prior prior to starting your installation. You need to know uh, a few things like uh, which um, uh, backup policy are you going to to retention policy are you going to use? Uh, which offsite uh, backup are you going to you know push your your, your dumps to? And also, for instance. Um, 
you know, yeah, those those things, the, the details about backup and, and scripts and all those kind of stuff, it's something that you need to uh, really plan even before before you start your installation. Something that you just do as a post is maybe maybe testing your backups. You've had your system up and running and you want to test and see if, if, if your backup uh, your backup script is doing its work. And number two, uh, can you kind of restore your backup in a fresh environment and is it working? Something like that. That's something that you do after the installation just to make sure that your backups are working and test that your, uh, your, your restore are working. Otherwise, planning for the backup is something that you do before you start installation. And um, all the, the, the bash scripts that we had before, the DHS2 tools have uh, backup scripts, which I'm still on process to put into the Ansible uh, scripts that we have. Question? Yes. I have one question. Okay, Gerard, you can come first. Okay. So my, my instincts had been always with this because um, um, though we are saying we are using open source, but um, we, we have been um, at a greater disadvantage when it comes to cloud hosting. And so backup is very necessary. So one of the things that I, I, I am peculiar about is actually doing backup at offsite. But then there was this project where I, I always have the, in mind where I, once you back up the, 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 the offsite, how do we like replicate the system? It just automatically replicates itself in, on the system. Maybe there is a script that does drop the database and deploy the new uh, uh, backup that you've already done, which is the backup testing and then we start the local instance and then it works. So that was one thing that I've already, I always take to um, the system administration um, uh, training, but it's something that I think um, all of us should collaborate in order for us to have a, a one script that can do all of this process, do the backup from online for the cloud hosting solution to a local system instance. And then on the local instance, you you can drop the database and rewrite the the new uh, or upload the new backup and then restart that instance because we we lose it. Sometimes we lose data because we don't have resources to make those payments and all the rest of it. So it had been a challenge actually when it comes to this part of Africa. We always have yeah. with resources. Yeah. Uh huh. Maybe I can comment on that. Um, broadly, I would say that backup uh, backup is also is something that is you know we can broadly classify into two main steps. One is um, making the backup on your host, You're just making uh, a dump of your of your running instance database, and then um, number two is now uh, storing that backup in in a place that is safe, which which in in this case is is remote. Um, you know, site. So um, the script that we're talking about needs to be able to do these two, this, these two, um, you know, components. One is it needs to be able to make a backup in on your host and then push that backup on uh, a place that is uh, safe uh, offsite. So um, we have scripts that does backup. Uh, the, the the scripts that were developed by Bob was, was doing a backup and pushing using uh, tools like rsync to another, another remote site that you want to push your backups to. And we also, um, uh, we, we could also, you know, push to S3 endpoints, you know, and S3 is, is uh, on cloud environments of, of your choice. Uh, and uh, mo mo normally we, we normally go for, um, I think Linode S3, but, major cloud providers like AWS and Google Cloud have S3 endpoints, which you could also push your backups to. But that or, or everything that I'm just uh, talking about needs to be automated in a way. Of course, uh, policy, backup policy is, retention policy is how many, uh, you know, uh, copies do you want to retain, daily copies do you want to retain? 
and how many weekly copies do you want to retain or even monthly copies do you want to retain or back up in your, in your offsite environment? Next question. Hello? Yes? Yes, I also wanted to ask, like Gerard said, this backup thing, because for us, even here, we are doing backup in the same systems, in the same Linode. So we're trying to find a way whereby we can do backup at uh, offsite so that in case that there's an, uh, something wrong with our primary instances, then the other one will just pick up uh, automatically. And it will be like a replicate of the same backup things that works because we are doing backup in the same instance. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because if you have a backup on 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 a, on a, on the same system, assume that same system is compromised. Then, yes. Then your backup is not useful anymore. It's not useful, yeah. Yeah, it's like shooting yourself in your leg. <laughs> so. Ah. No, we need to shoot Bob. Let's shoot Bob. Not. <laughs> <laughs> so. Where well, we could talk about off offsite backup uh, approaches that you you could uh, employ, and I've talked about S3, and you could also have another server sitting somewhere else. Just procure a server sitting on another another data center or another another cloud environment. Then you just you have a SSH station because RSync is using SSH uh, behind the scenes and push your backups to that uh, instance. Yeah. Okay, we, we've done the print, we're done with the presentations, but then uh, I, I just had uh, something for us uh, today, which is um, having this site, which I've actually, um, I, I deployed DHIS2 on this endpoint, but it's not accessible. I just broke it deliberately for us to, to have a discussion about. And um, when, I'm too, when I'm doing troubleshooting normally, the approach that I use is, is follow, follow the packet, you know, uh, from my client, from my Chrome browser or, or Safari or, or, or um, Firefox, you know. Um, uh, your traffic goes through the internet, through the proxy that you, you're using, which can be Apache 2 or the next. And then from there, it's rerouted to the backend application that serves your request. And depending on what you're doing, if you're retrieving data, then it reads data from the database and, and it gets back to you. Or if you're posting something, it depends on what you're doing really. Um, so this is this is also a guideline for, for, for the troubleshooting that you can follow, uh, that I have an installation. Um, so you can just segment into uh, steps, uh, starting from your browser and then gets to the network, which is the internet, and then to the proxy, from the proxy back to the uh, your app, and then finally to the database. So um, this site that you see here, um, which is HTTP, this domain is, is not accessible. And as you can see here, if we put it's getting.com load. Just put M. Has an, yeah, yeah. You see, this this is saying that the site can be can be reached. It's not accessible. It's different from uh, the one that I had before. Maybe let's just delete M there, and see. This is DNS broke. DNS broke possible. That means for this one, even this this domain does not exist. It's a DNS issue. So that 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 gets back to. Uh, post install a uh, troubleshooting guide that you need to have a domain that dissolves to uh, your server's public IP address. So because you can see even from the errors that we get from the browser here, that this is giving us a different a different kind of feedback that DNS broke possible. It's a problem of DNS. This is not dissolving to any public IP address or rather any server's IP address. And you can also test on the, on the terminal using tools uh, that are available like NS lookup puts the DNS here and uh, as you can see it is not it is not finding uh, IP address for that however these other um, these other sites that I just broke is really resolving to public IP address as you can see but again it's not accessible even if I put here M just to complete the thing is that it's not accessible you know so that means 
um, uh, it's first of all you've seen that it's resolving to public IP address that that is checked. But then, are you able to reach that server? So you could use tools like ping if your 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 server is exposing ICMP packets is enabling icmp packets however this is not to say that if you don't do, you're not receiving any echo replies that the server is, is down no sometimes even on the firewall level icmb is disabled but for, for this uh, for our case it's enabled and we are able to even ping that server and we've seen that we are able to um get to the, the dns is resolving to that um it's resolving to that server's ip address but we are not able to access on the browser so we've checked the first part that your, your, our browser is okay, the internet is okay, we are able to, sing our, uh, to ping our server. Now, uh, the problem could be lying on, on the proxy that we have running on that server, which is, which is Nginx. So you could, um, with SSH, SSH access that server. Uh, and um, just to make things easy, I had um, SSH into the server and we can list them, um, um, the containers that we have here. And we have proxy, we, we, we have proxy here. So of course the proxy is up, the, the, the container is, is, is deployed, but we are getting nothing. So one of the things that you can do is try connecting to, you know, proxy, our proxy normally is exposing two ports, 80 and 443. Try connecting to those uh, ports and you could, uh, you could use tools like Telnet telnet your servers are public ip address and then the, the ports that normally we are exposing on the proxy and as, as you can see we are unable to connect uh, even 443 we are unable to connect so that means our proxy is having a problem it's not uh, it could be the host firewall or the proxy itself not even listening or, or the service is not up so we've gotten to the um, to the server which is this one uh and we're seeing the proxies here so you can execute into the proxy with lxc except and you want to see you want to check if, if your proxy is listening or um, yeah, the service proxy service is listening on the network uh, you could use tools like ss tunnel p and here you see uh that we have nothing listening on port port 80 or 443, we have nothing completely. So that means our proxy service here is not um, listening. And you could check even the firewall here. That's another thing that you need to always check. Check uh, UFW status. And when check, we check the firewall, we see that it's listening on port 80 and then the, the ports traffic are not filtered on, on those two ports, they are just open. But then we have the real issue here is that we have we don't have service here. We don't have service listening on that uh, uh, port 80 or 443. So you could say service system CTL, depending on your, your proxy of choice, status in the next. You see that in the next service is not running. Here I had used in the next, uh, but it's not running. So uh, it's not running, and let's try starting it. System CTL. But we are getting errors. It's not coming up. You know, we are getting errors. And they are, they are actually, here we have an error, and normally, and it's not, normally most of the next errors are related to the configurations that you have. And you can, you can check configuration syntax with Nginx, dash T, that is gonna give you where, where, where the problem is normally. And in, in this case, it's on, um, um, I guess, line five. So you need to edit this file and, and, and see where the problem is. And in our case, I think it's, it's not terminated only. Uh, so you can edit, just um, edit this file with, with, with the editor of your choice and then um, line five. Uh, there's a line here that is not, uh, line five, uh, yeah, here it is. It's the here uh, server name. It needs to be terminated with semicolon. Yeah, and, and that was the problem. Why our our Nginx was not 
for example, running. So after that, you need to start your service, service or system CTR. Or you could check even indirectly if it's passing fast, configuration if it's passing. And now with Nginx minus T, you see that it's okay. It's not, it's no longer giving us this error. And you can now start your, your Nginx system. the next and it is started so let's check if now we can see port 80 and popo 3 on ss uh, command and for sure we are seeing port 80 and and then popo 3 they are listening on the network even when you get back to your your client whatever you are accessing from and tell that four four three uh, you're seeing that we are now able to connect this is now going to tell us that well our proxy is okay it's 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 accepting connections on 443 or even port 80, you can test the two. And you see, we are able to connect to the two comfortably. So that means uh, we've checked um, this part that our proxy is now okay, which is listening for port on, on port 80 and 443 over the internet. So are we now able to access our site? Let's reload. No we are getting empty response. So this is now the 443, remember the, the 444 error that you talked about, when you do not redirect uh, your traffic to, you know, it's this is just root. So, but it's not where your app is listening on. If you issue LXC list here on the host, your app is listening on uh, DHIS and, you know, endpoints. So this is the error that you just talked about before it's 444 error that when you had not you have not redirected your traffic to return to HMIs your wherever your application endpoint is you get an empty response but let's put uh, um, the name of our app there which is DHIS you, you are getting bad gateway this is this is another error now it means that our nginx the proxy is accessible it's trying to pass our request to the backend application but you know it's it's not it's five bad gateway our app is not responding so let's get back to our install again um lxc uh, but then um the app is dhis it's here uh, uh but proxy is not able to access that application. So we might say, let's execute into the, um, into the proxy and try pinging, try pinging our application, which is DHIS, just to make sure that the network is okay. And we're able to ping, you see, we are able to ping. But then what port is, is our application listening on? Normally it's port 8080, you know, uh, you could even tell that here. Um, standard Ubuntu container install comes with a telnet client. You could even telnet your server's IP, uh, your, your app's IP address on port 8080 and see. Uh, telnet spelling. I'm sorry. It's not able to connect. So that tells you that uh, you have um, installation here, but then it's not listening also. The same case, it's not listening on the network. And, and then one of the reasons why it's not listening is that maybe your Tomcat service is not running, uh, or number two, uh, your, your app didn't start, you know, didn't, comp didn't complete startup process, uh, or, and many, many other reasons, you know. Yeah, so you, you need to execute into the container, which is in our case proxy, I'm sorry, it's in our case is um, DHIS and see what's happening there. Normally you can check the logs, the Tomcat logs, but first thing that you could check is firewall. Do we have firewall running here? Yes, we do. Uh, but then our firewall is allowing connection from, um, from our proxy. So that, that is not, it's not the issue really because our proxy is 2.2 uh, and, and it's open. Uh, this entry here is open. Yeah. Uh, any question up to that point? No, I don't, Hello. I don't think there is a no. I don't think there is a question now. You can continue. Uh, yeah. We'll follow the, okay. Okay. So that means um, our our requests are getting to the proxy, which is this container here. But from this container. 
if they are not getting to the backend application. And we've seen firewall is okay, but do we have anything listening? Let's check what's listening on the network because you could have firewall exposing, opening that port of ours, 8080, but nothing is listening on that endpoint. So we could use SS um, tunnel PNC. Uh, indeed, uh, there's no service listening on port, port 8080. So that means our Tomcat service is not, is not running. So you could say PS out and then you grab you grab a uh, Tomcat for that matter. And of course uh, here, uh, there's nothing, listen nothing listening on that uh, on that endpoint. So what could make our Tomcat Tito, not? Tito, sorry, I'm gonna have to leave you. I know it's, but if, if, if you are happy and if there's still people happy to, to carry on, I think feel free. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, hello, sorry, Bob, before you leave, Hello. Yes, let me. Yes, let me. Yes. I, I have one suggestion because this is very good and it's really helpful. Like uh, maybe if we can have like uh, every Tuesday, if you can have like 10 minutes or 15 minutes added on top of this so that the issues people are um, addressing in the Telegram group to see how best we can resolve those ones. Because many people will report their problems and um, it's another way why we can try to see if this is the solution to their problem, then we can try with documentation to avoid such problems again. That's my suggestion. It was your su suggestion. We have we have 10 minutes allocated for this call to exactly. answer the particular user's questions. Questions, yeah. They normally um, send through the uh, Telegram group and to find a solution to that. So that for the benefit of others, in case it happens again. OK. Yeah. No, we can look into doing that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just a bit reluctant. Um, I mean, to just restrict it to the Telegram group because not everybody is on that. But for sure, yeah, we can take questions from there. And any other questions? If people have a particular question, they can send it directly to. Or we we might also look at um, the community of practice data. The community. Yeah. So, so what new posts have there been this last week, for example? Um, uh -huh. And see if we can make any comment on those. Yeah, good idea. I mean, all right, I'm going to have to love you and leave you, but uh, I'm sure Tito, you, you can carry on. If... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make it make it uh, summarize in a very few minutes. Uh, so that we can have this at uh, this side at least accessible quickly. So uh, uh, what you, you you normally do here is that you want to start your Tomcat instance and see what happens. Maybe you can follow logs and see what really happens with a system. Uh, it's bundled into simple system D service. So you do system CTL, uh, start Tomcat nine, and then you might want to follow the logs with general CTL minus follow um follow unit tomcat nine uh yeah uh, yes so this is going to start your tomcat and at the same time you're going to see on the logging what's really happening normally if you have connection errors to the database you will you will just have to see here why your tomcat instance was not coming you will get to know uh, the, where the problem lies. But uh, to shorten this demonstration, if there was no really a problem why this Tomcat was um, was not running. It was just because I, I had uh, shut down the, the instance. But then normally it could be related to instance connection to the database, an upgrade gone wrong, things like those ones. So you will see on the, on the logs that runs through here uh, that, that uh, where, where, where the problem is exactly. So yeah. So um, when once this instance is, is started, we will be able to again uh, access this site from there, from the internet. But then um, it will have checked uh, at least four of these these old components that we uh, make made sure that uh, our client is okay, the network is good, DNS is resolving, and then number two, 
the proxy is not the problem and the web application is not, is not the problem. But the problem could also even be lying on the database about the, um, the, 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 the firewall uh, blocking access from the, pro, uh, for, from the instance about data, uh, database configuration files that has entries for you know, BG, BGHP hair configurations. Because on that uh, file, it's where you configure uh, maybe application user and the password and where it's connecting from. It could be the reason uh, why you're not able to access is because of that file. So we will go up to this point. And I guess up, after that, we will have our service up and running. Any question after that, when the, when the app is coming up? Oh, yes, thank you so much for, for this meeting. It, it was a great meet. Um, uh, is there any way uh, to download this uh, these uh, recorded video or I can see later? Well, well yeah, normally when we, we have completed uh, this presentation and, and then it's pre-recorded and we normally upload to YouTube, um, this is to YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel. And if you want to follow even uh, all previous recording, you will find um, in that uh, channel. So after a day or two, we will have all these recording uploaded to the YouTube channel. Okay, so can you please send me the link of the YouTube channel so that I can see? Okay. And the, the, the channel has a lot of other things that you might even be interested in, in following. So let's see, after this application comes up, we should be able to access uh, this site. It will not give us 502 bad gateway anymore. It will be accessible, but it takes a while for the app to come up. Yeah. I guess that wraps up uh, what we had today. But we can just wait and see what we can get after the app comes up. Uh, just to mention also is that um, all these um, apps that we are demonstrating with right now um, are actually uh, installed with the automated uh, Ansible tools. DHIS2 server tools. So yeah, mostly you would not, you see that the app is now is now accessible. So the, the problem was there, but then as I mentioned, it could be somewhere else. It could be on the database. Uh, maybe if we have a call session that is really dedicated to troubleshooting, we might explore all the possible problems that we, we might encounter. But for the automated install, normally you would not get um, these problems, if, um, they will be fixed. However, in some situations where people are not using their tools, maybe it's not suiting their deploy architecture and they want to deploy in DHS2 uh, each and every component separately, then that means um, this is gonna be helpful, uh, helpful for them. Yeah. So right now the app is started and it's pretty much accessible from the, from the internet. Okay. Next slide is just for questions. If there's any question, otherwise we can, uh, we are actually on top of the hour. We are even past the hour, yeah. Do we have any questions? I don't want to say it. I have a question. I will just say thank you. Um, I think um, with reference to the backup, I think we, we've already put a hold to that. Uh, probably it might be part of the next session that we're going to have uh, mm -hmm. um, and pretty much what we're going to do in Rwanda. So um, I was to put that as a pending action for me, but, but but then um, this is good and, and, and it creates a lot of awareness. It's something that um, you have to have the love in order for you to go through the processes. And, and for me, I spend most of my time doing what you're currently doing, fixing problems, identifying problems. And, mm -hmm. and that is how I learned as fast as I could. So, yeah, I, I, um, the, the, 
this is just an addition to the package and and i appreciate it more and, and it's something that i want to keep um, moving forward yeah yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Go ahead. So, so i wanted to say that things that i just talked about right now you know uh we've not i've not gone really deep into you know because each and every component here could be its own topic you know when you talk about postgres tuning it can be can be its own session you know uh, when you talk about nginx or whatever it can be a whole complete two hour session so these topics are going to be deep dived in, in rwanda you're gonna be going to uh, have each and every session talking about one topic extensively uh, yeah Otherwise, we can just uh, finish at that point for today's call. And thank you, every, everyone, for, for joining. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay.